All right, so we've read Mark 14, verses 27 to 52. Let's go ahead and pray together and ask the Lord to open our hearts uh, as we dive into this passage this morning. So, Father, we do thank you so much just for this day that you've given to us. We thank you so much just for the joy it is to be able to gather together with your people, Lord, to sing songs of praise to you, to worship you, because you are truly worthy. And Lord, we come to now to the part of our service, Lord, that is really the most important, where your word is open, Father, and where we invite you to really speak to our hearts. God, we know that everything we need for life and for godliness is contained here in the pages of Scripture. And so, Lord, I pray that you will help us, Father, to set aside anything that may be weighing down our minds, Lord, and distracting us from what is most important here in this hour. And help us, Lord, just to focus on you and what it is you have to teach us. Father, I pray that we didn't come here today just to check some religious duty off of a box for the week, but Lord, that today we came here because we desperately want to meet with you. We desperately want you to speak to us. And so Lord, I pray that now in these moments that we share together, as the word of God is open before us, that you will guide my words, Lord, as I try to, Father God, just uh, break down this passage in a way that helps us better understand it. But Father, we know that the ultimate teacher is your spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that he will just move in our hearts, that he will give us understanding and clarity to what it is that needs to be said. And it's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you go to almost any community around America, you will find various nonprofit organizations that are making a positive impact for the community. You can look around New Milford, for instance, and find many different nonprofits that do a great deal of good here within our community, whether it is feeding the hungry, assisting the poor, or helping those in vulnerable conditions, nonprofit organizations make a big difference in our world. Now, there's one national nonprofit that I think is really neat. There's many, but one that I want to highlight, and that is the Make a Wish Foundation. Anybody ever heard of the Make a Wish Foundation? All right, probably many of you have. It was Founded in the United States in 1980 and helps fulfill the wishes of children with a critical illness between the ages of two and a half and 18 years old. And so their mission, their goal is to help children, sometimes with terminal illnesses, accomplish something or do something or meet someone that's kind of on their bucket list, right? Whether it's meeting someone famous or a hero that they have or sending them on some sort of trip of a lifetime, the Make-A-Wish Foundation has brought a smile to many faces, many children over the years who otherwise were facing pretty grim outlooks on life. And even though it doesn't change their condition, it does give them something to smile about in those last days of their life. And so as we think about final days of our life, and again, many of you know, uh, death has been a reality in my family over the last couple months. I've been to a couple funerals and, uh, from, for grandfathers. And so this idea is you know, kind of on the forefront of my mind. And so as we think about this morbid topic of death, I want to ask you, if you knew that your life was going to end in a matter of days or a matter of hours, what would you set out to do? Now, again, none of us know the hour, right? None of us know exactly when that's going to happen. But if you did, if you were privy to the information of when you were going to die, what are the things that you would do to fill up those last hours of your life? Maybe you'd go on a trip somewhere. Maybe you'd go meet somebody. Maybe you'd do any number of things. Well, here in our passage, Jesus is well aware that his life is about to end. The cross is right around the corner. In a matter of hours, he is going to give his life as a ransom for the sin of mankind. And we see Jesus facing one of the darkest situations of his life. The Last Supper has ended. The religious leaders are lurking. And the final sands in the hourglass of Jesus' life have almost fallen. It's one of the darkest moments in the life of Jesus. And it's not just because this particular event is taking place at nighttime. Jesus is in distress because the cross is only hours away. And of all the things he could have done or all the places he could have gone to spend those final hours, he chose the solitude of the Garden of Gethsemane where he could get alone with his father and spend some final hours in prayer before the God that he loved, the father he loved so dearly. 
And so this is how he's going to spend his final moments as a free man. This is how he's going to spend some of the final hours of his life there on the Garden of Gethsemane. And what happened there in that garden was not only significant for Jesus and his disciples, but it also had a major impact on humanity as a whole. And today we're going to look at Jesus' time in the garden and see several applications that you and I can draw from this account. Because as we look at Jesus and the prayer he prayed, and we look at the disciples and how they acted during that time, and as we look at Judas and his betrayal, there's a lesson for all of us in each of those stories. And so that's what I want us to do today. Instead of just reading through it and kind of seeing it as a historical event that took place, I want us to be able to bring it home into our own lives and see how can I make application to what is going on here in this story. And so as we begin, the title is simply this, Watch and Pray, because that is what the disciples were instructed to do, watch and pray. And really, that's what we're instructed to do a lot in our life, right? Watch What God is doing, live with an attitude that he will return soon and pray without ceasing, right? Continue to be in that attitude of prayer. So watch and pray was a command given to the disciples there in the garden. As we begin this passage, I want you to first of all see that as we look in the story today, there is definitely an attitude that you and I should reject. And I'll tell you what it is right off the bat. It is an attitude of self-reliance. Ever been in a situation where you got a little too self-reliant? Relied on your own resources, your own strength, your own ability, your own knowledge, instead of resting in the knowledge, resources, and ability of God in said particular situation? Well, that's what we see here as this passage opens up. Look with me, if you will, in verse number 27. As they've sung the hymn to close out their time there in the upper room. They are making their way across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it says in verse 27, And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now understand, there's a lot of what takes place in this account of these events that isn't recorded here and is recorded in some of the other Gospels, right? In John, you have the high priestly prayer of Jesus. You have him talking about, I am the vine, you are the branches, and some of those things. Here in Mark, we have a major focus on Peter. Because remember, Mark is really Peter's account. Peter's telling of these events to John Mark, who is writing them down. And just to jump ahead, you saw the last verses that... We're read about the young man who fled the scene. Many people believe this may have been John Mark, who may have been there and who may have fled along with the other disciples. And so, again, it's interesting where John Mark is coming into play. But we see here in Mark's account that a lot of it focuses on Peter, because, again, this is Peter telling the story to John Mark. And so you can find other details of what's happening here in the garden when you go to Luke or when you go to Matthew or when you go to John. So understand, it doesn't mean the Bible is contradicting itself. It just simply means that the certain authors are recording certain things that maybe some of the others have chosen not to record. And all of it inspired by God, the Spirit, you know, moving in their hearts to write these certain things down from their perspective. So this passage begins with an Old Testament prophecy that is about to be fulfilled before them. Again, notice what it says. It is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That comes from Zechariah 13, 7. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. And so there in Zechariah, this very moment was prophesied. This very moment was foretold. And so Jesus, there in the garden, gives them this prophecy. Jesus knew that Judas was not the only one of the twelve that would distance themselves from Jesus in these moments. In fact, they were all going to fall away. Their betrayal might not be as open and as deceptive and as harsh as Judas's, but all of them, to an extent, were going to turn their backs on Jesus in his darkest hour. 
And you would think that after hearing these words, they would be a little bit more on guard, wouldn't you? If Jesus just told you that you're going to turn your back on me, don't you think that you would really want to just lean in even harder? Pray even harder. Lord, help me not to do what he says I'm going to do. Help me not to reject him in this moment. But yet that's not the attitude we see here from the disciples. After hearing these words, notice that Peter was quick to interject his thoughts. Now you would think Peter would have learned by now, wouldn't you? I mean, we've been going through this gospel and on and on we've seen Peter open mouth and insert foot. And here we have another moment where Peter just speaks without really thinking. And I think his motives are good. And deep down, he thought this was going to be true. But he's speaking to the Messiah, the one who knows all things, the one who knows what's about to happen. And notice what Peter says in verse 29. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Jesus, if I have to die with you, I will die with you. And they all agreed that that was a stand that they were taking here in the garden. And yet, as we fast forward in the story, that is not what happens. The prophecy that Jesus told them was fulfilled, and as they strike the shepherd, the sheep all scatter. So certainly Peter would not deny Christ. He was ready to deny with them. All the disciples shared the same sentiment. However, despite their good intentions, reality was going to tell a different story. And we see as we walk through the story of the Garden of Gethsemane that these disciples became self-reliant and failed to recognize their own frailty. Instead of being humble and recognizing the temptation surrounding them, they relied on their own strength and their own wisdom and their own knowledge. And they said, certainly we will not deny you. We will go with you. We will die with you. But never do we see them praying, asking God for the strength to help them in these moments. Instead, we see them relying just on their own feelings, their own passions, their own desires. And when Jesus tells them to watch and pray, what do they do? They fall asleep. It shows us the self-reliance of the disciples in this very dark hour. Of Jesus's life. And all throughout scripture, we see the dangers of self-reliance. Think about Israel's first king, Saul. Everything started out good for Saul. He was humble. He sought the Lord. All those kind of things. But eventually, as his power grew and his fame grew, he began to distance himself from the Lord. And we find a sad story in verse number 8 of 1 Samuel 13. It says this, He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went to meet him and greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come with the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Mithmash, it goes on to say, I took matters into my own hands and I went ahead and offered the offering. Self-reliance. Thinking he can go against what God had commanded and just go ahead and offer the sacrifice himself instead of waiting for Samuel, the high priest, to come. Let's look at the next king of Israel, David. Again, a lot of good traits we see in David, killing Goliath and all the victories that he had. But there were moments where he became self-reliant. When all the kings were off at battle and he should have been there leading the troops, where was he? On his rooftop, letting his guard down, allowing himself to fall into temptation ending up in one of the biggest downfalls of his life. 
because he became self-reliant and was not where he should have been. And so maybe you've been there. Ever been in a place where you've gotten self-reliant? Where you've relied on your own strength, your own resources, your own abilities, your own knowledge, your own talents? Instead of leaning into the Lord and what it is that he wanted to do through you? You see, self-reliance is a close cousin to pride, and we must strive to reject self-reliance at every turn. James 4, 6 tells us this, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. And here we see, instead of having an attitude of humility where the disciples say, God, help us. We don't want to fall away. God, help us to be strong in these moments. God, help us to resist the temptations that are going to arise. Help us to not turn our backs on Jesus. They instead relied on their own strength and their own abilities and said, we will die for you. And then moments later, they're sleeping. When he's praying. And so we must be aware of self-reliance. Even after hearing the words from this prophecy that Jesus gave them, the disciples failed to pray for the strength and wisdom they needed in the moment. Instead of praying, they were sleeping. And again, how often do we tend to rely on our own strength, our own wisdom, and our own resources instead of leaning into the strength and the power of God as we face various situations in our lives? How many times do we just pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and say, I'm going to get through this. Instead of saying, God, I need your help. God, I can't do this without you. You see, the disciples were self-reliant instead of approaching the situation with an attitude of humility. So we see as this passage opens up, there is definitely an attitude for you and I to reject. Be careful not to become self-reliant because self-reliant is a close cousin to pride and when pride gets in it wreaks all sorts of havoc in our lives but not only is there an attitude to reject we see that there is also tucked in the midst of this encounter there is a promise to remember i intentionally skipped over verse 28 as i was going through this account because this is a verse that is so powerful, but it's so easy to skip over. It says, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So again, in verse 27, he gives the prophecy. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. It goes on then for Peter to shout up and say, no, even though they all fall away, I will not. But tucked in there is verse 28 that says, but after I am raised up. I will go before you to Galilee. Isn't that a great promise? The disciples understood that Jesus has been talking about his death. They knew that he was about to die. They didn't know all the details. They didn't know exactly why. And there's still a lot of confusion in their minds about all these things. But they were aware of the fact that he said he was going to die. And that kind of rocked their theology because they thought he was the Messiah coming to conquer Rome. And so there's a lot of things they haven't figured out in this moment. And so they know that he's going to die. But wouldn't this be a great promise to cling to in the midst of that? I will go before you to Galilee. In that verse, he is saying, listen, I'm going to die. You're going to scatter. But don't worry. I will meet you in Galilee in just a matter of days. Isn't that hopeful? Isn't there a lot of hope in that verse? And we're going to talk about that here in a couple weeks as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together. But here, tucked in the midst of this interaction between Jesus and his disciples, he reminds them that, listen, death is not the end of the story. Death is just a step in what's ultimately going to be God's glory revealed through me as I am raised and then ascended into heaven. And so we see this great promise that he gives that I will go ahead of you to Galilee. He was not going to stay dead. He would rise again. And no matter how difficult things may get on this side of glory, there is hope in the resurrection. 
And I love the hymn, He Lives. If you've not heard it, it says, Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because He lives, there is hope. Is the whole essence of that hymn. I can face whatever it is that comes my way because Jesus lives. I do not serve a dead God. I do not serve a dead Savior. My Savior walked out of the grave and he lives forever and eternity and promises that I will meet him one day in glory. Amen. And if that doesn't light your fire, listen. As a preacher used to say, your wood's wet, because that should excite you. That should get you excited about living the Christian life. Because no matter what happens here and now, there is hope of resurrection. Because Jesus walked out of the grave. And so here, tucked in the midst of this interaction where Jesus says, hey, you're all going to turn your backs on me. And then say, no, we're not. We're dying with you. He gives them this promise that, hey, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. And so what a glorious hope that we have as God's children, knowing that we too will meet him one day. 1 Peter 1.3 says it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the dead. A living hope that we have because Jesus has risen from the dead. So, church, can I remind us? This is a promise that we have today. We serve a resurrected Savior, one who has conquered death once and for all. And so, no matter how bad things may get on this side, there is always something to hope for. And so we see there's a promise to remember. There's an attitude of self-reliance to reject. Thirdly, I see that as we continue on in this passage, that there's a prayer that you and I should strive to emulate. And that is really the whole crux of this passage and what takes place in Gethsemane, and that is Jesus praying. The crux of what happens here on Gethsemane is the prayer of Jesus. So look with me in verse number 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. So he's going to take his inner circle with him. He's going to leave the others there. So what's my math? The other eight, right? Because one has betrayed him, has gone off to be with the religious leader. So you have 11 left. Eight are going to stay here. And Jesus is going to go a little farther in the garden and take with him his inner circle, his three. The same three he took up on the mountain when he was transfigured before them. His three closest companions. He's going to take them with him and says, begin to be distressed and troubled. Greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. Remain here and watch. Now, he didn't even tell him to do anything except for watch. What he's saying is, hey, just sit here and watch and be alert and be ready. Your closeness, your presence to me in this moment is important. So just be here and watch. And the Bible goes on to say that he goes a little farther and fell to the ground and prayed. And if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. So while the, the disciples are demonstrating this attitude of self-reliance, Jesus is showing us what an attitude of submission looks like. His heart was heavy. The Bible says he was greatly distressed. And he asked the disciples to stay close by, to watch for him. It is in this prayer that we again see the humanity of Jesus on display. Spiritually, he knew that he must die. There was no other way for the sins of mankind to be forgiven than that he died on the cross. Or that his blood be shed. But physically speaking, it was not something that he was looking forward to. 
I mean, how would you feel if you knew the cross was imminent? Even though you knew it was part of the mission God has given you, there's a, a fleshly part of you that says, man, is there any other way? Is there any other way that this can be accomplished? The cross was agony. The nails in your hand, the nails in your feet, the, the gasping for breath. The most horrible way to die. And so he's there in Galgai, there, there in Gethsemane, saying, Lord, if there's any other way, Abba, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. But yet not my will. Yours be done. Was there another way? In fact, Luke tells us this was such an intense time of prayer. It says that being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I mean, he is intensely praying. If you study medicine, there is a, I don't know what it's called, I didn't look uh, too into it, but it is possible, you know, for you to be just so intense that your sweat turns to blood, and Luke, the doctor, records that for us. I think it's interesting that Luke's the one that writes that down, because that would have been amazing to him as a physician. But we see that he is in agony. He is praying, Lord, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But I love what we see here in Jesus and just the relationship that Jesus had with the Father. Notice what he says here as he prays. He says in verse 36, Abba, Father, any of you who have had kids, little kids, know kind of the intimacy that is revealed in these words. It's like your, your little child saying, Dada. Dada. That's the intimacy that that word Abba portrays. Or portrays. And so we see this great intimacy that Jesus is having with the Father. And that's what prayer is meant to be. Did you know that? That's what prayer is meant to be. It's meant to be just this sweet time of fellowship between you and the Father. But if I'm honest, if you'll let me be honest, a lot of times my prayer looks like the disciples. I've been guilty on more than one occasion of trying to pray and falling asleep. But this is what prayer is meant to be. It's meant to be just this intimate relationship where you can connect with the Father. And you can pour your heart out to him. You can uh, reveal to him and share with him those things that are just, you know, troubling you and that are bothering you and that are concerning you. And you can just pour your uh, heart out to him because he knows your heart anyways. And so we see just this amazing prayer that begins on the foundation of the relationship that Jesus has with the Father but it is a prayer that is uh, not only centered on that relationship, but that is, you know, guided by this attitude of submission. He knew that God's ways were perfect. And what he wanted was, more than anything was to submit to the Father. He said, I'm not looking forward to this whole cross thing. If there's any other way that your mission can be accomplished, I'm asking that you reveal and allow that to happen. But even more so... It's your will that I desire more than anything else, not my own. He was going to be obedient, but wanted to make sure that he was fully submitting to God's will. And there's a difference between obedience and submission. Did you know that? It's easy to obey when God's telling us to do something that's easy and that we'd like to do anyways. But submission comes in when our will and God's will don't really align. Ever been there? When you want to go this direction and God says, no, I want you to go here. Or you want to do this and God says, no, I want you to do this. And you're reading the word and you're like, oh, that verse, I've never seen it quite like that before. Do I really need to like live this out? And the spirit of God, yeah, that's what the word is saying, right? And, then, and all those things, you've been there? It's not just me, right? So there's a difference between obedience and submission. Submission 
says, okay, I have my will, but I'm going to superimpose God's will on top of mine and make sure that my will aligns completely with his. That is submission. But so often what we want to do is we want to say, hey, God, I'm going to go this direction. Can you just kind of bless it along the way? I really want to know that I have your blessing as I do my own thing. That is not submission. And in Psalms, when it says that God will give you the desires of your heart, delight in him, and he'll give you the desires of your heart, we like to say that God is like this genie that's just going to do whatever we want. But what we forget is that the verse starts with delight yourself also in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. So can I tell you, here's a secret. If you're delighting yourself in the Lord, guess what your desires are going to be? His. And then he'll give you the desires of your heart. And so we need to understand there's a difference between obedience and submission. And Jesus was not only going to be obedient, he wanted to make sure he was living in submission to the Father. Tim Keller said this, the basic purpose of prayer is not to bend God's will to mine, but to mold my will into his. Isn't that good? The basic purpose of prayer is not to bend God's will to mine, but to mold my will into his. We have no problem obeying God when it's something we want to do. But how do we do in those moments when our will and God's will are opposed? And our desires and God's desires are different. True submission overlays God's will on top of our own. And here, he tells the disciples to watch. And we see that they had this great opportunity before them, didn't they? He comes back after an hour of praying and they're sleeping. He says, you couldn't even watch for an hour? Now let's give them some credit, some slack. It was nighttime, right? It was at night. They've had a long day. There was a lot of emotions probably in that day. And so if you were in their shoes, you might have slept too. Again, I've been guilty on many occasions of falling asleep while trying to pray. And so he says, let's continue on the story. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Then verse 38, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went again away and prayed, saying the same words. Again, this prayer of submission and again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. So he comes back after an hour and finds them sleeping. What, you can't watch for an hour? Watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he goes off to pray some more, and they come back, and he comes back and finds them what? Sleeping again. They had the opportunity to join him in prayer, to lift him up in this dark hour of his life in prayer, and instead they are sleeping. And then what happens a third time? He came to them the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayer as a hand. Did you know that, as one preacher has said, opportunities have a shelf life? Opportunities have a shelf life. They have an expiration date. And if you keep pushing off the opportunities that God gives you, there's going to be a point where that opportunity will no longer be there. The disciples had a great opportunity to really link arms with Jesus in prayer and join him in this dark hour of his life, but instead they were sleeping. And finally, Jesus comes back and says, it's okay, you're tired, let's go on. But they never had that opportunity again. And so I say that to say this, when God is nudging you to take a step of faith, 
And when you know that there's an opportunity for you to share the love of Jesus with somebody or to, you know, grow in a certain area of your Christian life and you just kind of push it off for another day, can I remind you that that opportunity will not be there forever? So when the opportunity is there, take advantage of the moment. Don't just put it off. Because these disciples had a great opportunity to join with him in prayer. Right? And that's all he was asking. Just watch and pray. You've had people come to you, right, and say, hey, can you pray for me? I mean, how much encouragement is it when they ask you to pray for them and they know that you're praying for them? And that's why we have a prayer chain that goes throughout and somebody has a need, they text Paul and say, hey, pray for this. And all of a sudden it goes out to all these people because we want them to know, hey, we are praying for you. Because there's power in prayer. When you know that people are praying for you, there's great power in knowing that. And Jesus comes to his disciples and say, watch and pray. They know that he's in agony. They know he's distressed. They know he's dealing with so much. The weight of the world is on his shoulders. And he asks them to simply pray. And they're sleeping. Opportunity missed. Never to be had again. And so we see this powerful prayer that Jesus gives us here. This prayer that's rooted in his relationship with the Father. This prayer that is uh, basically guided by this attitude of submission. Not your will, but, or not my will, but yours be done. That's what our prayer should be about. We should anchor into the relationship we have with our Father. Worship him and praise him for who he is and for the great relationship we have with him. And then as we pray and offer requests and say, God, you know, I want you to do this. We make sure that God help my will to be aligned with yours. And I pray all these things, not according to my will, but according to your will. And so we see there's a prayer here that Jesus gives us in Gethsemane that you and I should emulate. Which brings us to our final point. So we've seen an attitude to reject. We've seen a promise to remember. We've seen a prayer to emulate. And now let's look at the fourth thing, which is there is a legacy to avoid. There is a legacy to avoid. Do you know you're all leaving a legacy behind? Whether you have kids or not, you're leaving a legacy. Go to any cemetery around and you'll see a birth date. And a death date, and in between those two dates, you will see a what? A dash. That dash represents you, your life, the impact you made, the legacy you're leaving. All of us will leave a legacy. And my hope and my prayer is that your legacy will not be one of, like Judas. Let's look at what his legacy is. Verse 43, and immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came. We talked about Judas last week, how sad. Had every opportunity to repent and continued to do his own thing. Now, maybe we can give Judas some slack. Maybe he was just trying to kind of rush things ahead. He knew that Jesus had to die, and so he was just making it easier. He was just rushing it along. Some people want to claim that that's, you know, Judas was kind of the hero in the story. But even if that's the case... He's still not trusting the timing of God, and so he's still being self-reliant, and so that doesn't really fly either. Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs. Isn't that interesting? The Lamb of God. The Prince of Peace. And they're coming with swords and with clubs. From the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. Think about that moment. Judas has walked with Jesus for three years. 
Judas has performed miracles in Jesus' name. Judas has told people about the Messiah. And yet, in his darkest hour, it is Judas who betrays him to the hands of the religious leaders. What a sad legacy to leave behind, isn't it? All the good that Judas did isn't remembered. What do we remember Judas for? This right here. Sometimes our worst moment, unfortunately, can be the moment that is our legacy. Now, thankfully, there's grace and forgiveness in Jesus, and Judas could have found that. But can I just encourage you? Can I challenge you? Don't let Judas' legacy be your legacy. Now again, I know that you're probably not going to portray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and you don't have that opportunity, but you do have the opportunity to sit here in church and learn about him and then go out and not live for him. You do have the opportunity to sit here and say you love Jesus and then allow your life not to reflect it. You do sit here and know that you're called to go and make disciples, and then when you leave here, and never say a thing about Jesus. Like, you have that opportunity. You have the opportunity to know about God in your head and never allow it to seep down in your heart. And that's the legacy of Judas. He did all sorts of things for Jesus, but never understood the part of having a relationship with him. And there are people sitting in churches all over the world today who claim to know Jesus but have no idea about a relationship with him. And that's why he says that one day there's going to be a separation. And people are going to come and say, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because we get good at convincing ourselves that the things we do for Jesus, the things we do for God, the things we say about God, are enough to make up for our lack of relationship with him. But don't let that be your legacy. Don't allow your life to come to an end and you get to a place where he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Because all along you've deceived yourself into thinking that all the things you've done were enough to make up for the lack of relationship that you didn't have. Are you tracking with me this morning? Or I guess it's technically now, this afternoon, it's noon. So don't let that be your legacy. What a sad legacy that Judas left behind, now known as the one who betrayed Judas. Right, I've met a lot of people in life who are named Peter. I've met a lot of people named John. I've met a lot of people named James. Met a lot of people named Matthew. You know who I haven't met a lot of people named? Judas. I mean, I'm sure there are some, and if your name's Judas or you're watching online and your name's Judas, I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying it's not nearly as popular as some of those other names. Why? Because when we think of Judas, what do we think of? The one who betrayed the Messiah. Had every opportunity to make a difference in the world like the other 11. But chose to do his own thing. Because of his greed and his self-reliance and his pride. Don't let that be your legacy. See, at the end of the day, we focus on a lot of things that at the end of the day really don't matter, don't we? We focus on a lot of things that really, at the end of the day, are insignificant. But what matters is Christ, your relationship with him, and what you've done for him. Those are the things that last. Judas had every opportunity to have a different story, to have a different legacy. But yet he didn't. And so don't let that be 
your story. So here in the passage before us, I think there are four important truths that we must understand, four important applications that we need to draw from in our own lives. Again, we can read the story, and it's a powerful story just to read through, but as you pause to consider all that's going on here, there are a lot of applications that we can take for, for our own lives. And the first one is there's an attitude that we need to reject, right? Don't be self-reliant. Don't allow self-reliance to be your MO in life. Humble yourself. Rest in Jesus. Allow your, allow your life to rely on the strength that he provides. Don't rely on your own strength, your own resources, or all those things. There's a promise to remember. No matter how difficult things get, remember, he was going ahead of them to Galilee. He wasn't staying in the tomb. He is alive. Thirdly, there's a prayer to emulate. Prayer is vital to our relationship with God. But it's not just about coming to God with this laundry list of things we want him to do for us. It's about coming to God in relationship. Saying, Father, I want to draw close to you. I want your will to become my will. I want my desires to be your desires. That is a heartbeat of prayer, an attitude of submission. And then as you do all those things, you can help avoid the legacy that Judah had. Because it certainly shows us here that there is a legacy that we need to avoid in this story. And that is the legacy of Judas. So again, four applications that I brought to your attention today, and the Holy Spirit may have brought others to your attention. And so the challenge today is, as we look at the events of Gethsemane, may we be people who aren't self-reliant, who aren't like Judas, but may we be people who are focused on the Lord and desperately desiring to live in submission to him. May we be people who pursue Jesus with everything that we are so that we can have a legacy that when people look at the dash of our life, they'll say that was somebody who walked with Jesus. That's somebody who made an impact for the kingdom. That's the kind of legacy God wants you to leave. It's my hope and prayer that today, the Spirit of God will help you see what it is in your life that's keeping that from happening and how it is you can take steps to make sure that happens from this day forward. So, Father, thank you for the truth we find in your word. Thank you so much just for the opportunity we have just to gather together. Lord, for your word to be open before us. And, Father, now in these moments, I pray that we will have an open heart to respond to the way that you want us to respond. Father, there is one of two things we can do when your word is preached. We can allow it to take root in our lives and produce fruit. Or we can allow the ground of our heart to be hard, never allowing that seed to penetrate. But God, I pray that today, under the sound of my voice, both here in this room and online, we will have people with open hearts ready to receive what it is you want them to receive today. May this be a room full of people who desire to leave a legacy behind that is worthwhile. A legacy behind that is positive for the kingdom. A legacy that touches people because of their love for Jesus. And may we have people in this room who desire to pursue you and submit to you more than anything else in this life. So, God, we pray that you will work in our hearts. Draw us to yourself. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.